We are in the, uh, in the middle of a, a Jewish apologetics series, as most of you know, who have been coming to our congregation uh, for the last couple of months. Uh, the series is a series answering Jewish objections to Yeshua. We're confronting the, uh, the objections that are being raised to our faith by the Jewish community. And uh, the series of sermons is already available online, thanks to Chris, who has been putting all of these uh, sermons online and uh, the recordings, uh, thanks to, to uh, Herman and the others who are arranging that. And you can find them now, the website, that uh, all you have to do is remember, nobody uses www anymore. They kind of assume that, I think, on the web. You don't even have to type that in. Just put in Ben David MJC. Pretty easy to remember, .org, and uh, it'll take you uh, right to our website, and you can find all of these uh, sermons that are in this Jewish apologetics series. Now, this morning, this morning, believe it or not, we are in our doing our tenth message in this series, which is, by the way, uh, we're not saying exactly how long it will be, but just want you to know that the list of objections that we started at when we began the whole series was over 150. And I'm not saying we're going to cover all of them, but uh, there are quite a few, and um, some of them some of them might surprise you, and, and yet some of them you look at and say, oh yeah, I, I've kind of heard that kind of objection voiced, and I've always wondered about how to respond best to it, or how can we respond. Well, the one this morning as I was preparing for it, was one that kind of when I, when I looked at it and I, I picked these things out from the list and I looked at this uh, particular objection, it was, it was almost, it was de depressing to me, I must admit. I, I was, you know, I've been a believer for many years now and somehow um, when I was new in the faith, it seemed like objections were, oh, I, got, I need to worry about that and, you know, and, and come up with an answer. But now that I see some of these things, I don't know, I've been walking with the Lord for, for quite a while, I, I'm kind of disappointed that these are still hanging around. You know, haven't these all been handled yet? Are we put all of these behind us? Well, apparently not. But this is one that people have already told me, oh yes, oh yes. We need to know how to address it because it does come up. And I've abbreviated it with these words. The New Testament is anti-Semitic. If you pause for a minute and think of that accusation and allegation, it, the first thing I, 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 that comes up in me is kind of like a, ah, oh, have you so little knowledge of the New Testament that you actually believe that? I almost don't know where to start with that. It's like, it's like there's an ocean of information that, you might, that comes to mind, but it's overwhelming to think that somebody would actually feel this way. The full text that is presented in, uh, in this uh, list of objections, by the way, taken uh, from Michael Brown's uh, five-volume series on answering Jewish objections uh, to Jesus. But um, this is just one of them. The full text of this particular one appears uh, here. Begins with these words. And I'm just going to pause and take a look at this so you can grasp what it is we're going to try to answer this morning. The origins of anti-Semitism can be traced to the, to the pages of the New Testament. And by anti-Semitism in our discussion this morning, I'm going to simplify it as simply the hatred of Jews. It's amazing to me when you go and look out there about how people define anti-Semitism some are still struggling with what that is and how to define it. Uh, 
I don't know if you're aware of a, an organization I mentioned this morning to, I was talking to Chris a little bit about this, an organization called the IHRA. Has anybody ever heard of the IHRA? It's the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, which is an international organization that one, uh, and one, of their, one of the things that they have done is put together an acceptable or at least a starting definition of what anti-Semitism anti is. I was going to spend a little time on that, but I thought, you know what? That's going to take us off track. Let us this morning simply think of anti-Semitism as hatred of Jews. So the beginning of this objection says the origins of this can be traced to the pages of the New Testament. And it continues, from the negative depiction of the Pharisees to the charge of deicide, anti-Semitism is an ongoing Christian plague. And if you just look at that for a moment and think about it, I think you, you can see right away that this is an accusation that has a number of parts to it. I'm going to break it down into four, four specific parts. Part one is what I'm saying is anti-Semitism began, quote, in the pages of the New Testament. It says it began, the origins of anti-Semitism in the pages of the New Testament. The second part is, of this objection is that the New Testament presents a negative depiction of the Pharisees. Part three, that the New Testament alleges the Jewish community is guilty of deicide, which is uh, translated, I mean, and the meaning of the word deicide is simply killing God, putting God to death. And the fourth part of this allegation is that anti-Semitism is an ongoing Christian plague. You know, every single one, every single part of this kind of bothers me. I don't know if it bothers you when it appears there, but uh, every, single, every single part, it just kind of was upsetting to me. And as I have researched responding to these, I have decided that uh, this, calling this uh, together as a group a, a single objection, deserves, are you ready? I need a drum roll. Here's the drum, okay. This, this objection at the top of the slide, the, the three lines at the top, deserves three and a half Pinocchios. I don't want to make light of it too much, but I want to make a point. Doesn't quite get to four Pinocchios, in my opinion. So let's take a look at in care, uh, carefully at each one of the four parts to this. Begin with part one. Anti-Semitism began in the pages of the New Testament. I'm going to answer this one, approach this in three different areas. The first area is that, and you can address it in many ways, this is just my thoughts on it. Anti-Semitism when you think about it, was practiced by other nations long before the New Testament was written. How can you, how can you say, how can anyone say that it began in the pages of the New Testament when it was practiced earlier? I, I, it didn't take me long to put together a list of countries that hated the Jews from early on. I went back, then, you know, and I thought about it, said, well, when they went to Egypt, it didn't take long before they were enslaved by the uh, Egyptians. Somewhere around uh, in the 1500s, the date is a little fuzzy there, but uh, in that time frame. 
after they managed to leave Egypt, with God's help, of course, it wasn't long before they were attacked by a group known as the Amalekites. They hated the Jews. Then in the circa 1400 or so, which is about the time that after the wilderness wandering of 40 years and they were beginning to enter the land under Joshua, you remember that uh, even before they crossed the Jordan and then again after they did, they were attacked by Amorites and um, in the land they, in that time frame, they were attacked by Canaanites who were resident in the land. They hated the Jewish, uh, the Jews because of course they were taking, they thought they were taking their land but really it was God's land that he was giving to Israel. But the Canaanites developed an instant hate for the Jews in the year of roughly 721 or so, the Assyrians attacked the northern portion of Israel and took control of that and took the, many of the residents out of the land. And uh, we call it Israel. By then it had been divided into a north and a south and they attacked and took, took control of the north. And uh, not too long after that, the Babylonians uh, attacked and uh, took control of Judah, as you recall in the south when they, uh, they also destroyed the first temple, the Babylonians did. In about 480 or so, after the Persians had uh, taken, uh, pushed the, per uh, the Babylonians out, there was somebody by the name of Haman. I uh, had a feeling that would wake some, uh, that's, that's fine. That's the one time it's good to comment in the middle of a message. Um, but. Uh, he was guilty of uh, not just hating Mordecai, he was guilty of hating all the Jews and wanted to kill all the Jews, as you recall. Then there's the example of the, uh, not uh, a few years, uh, a few hundred years later, the Syrians, led by somebody named Antiochus, uh, and he called himself Epiphanes, um, it's the living God, which was uh, certainly not true, but anyway, he uh, invaded Israel and tried to uh, end all the Jewish culture and study of the Torah and so on and so forth. Uh, he was also, I would deem him to be anti-Semitic. So we have all of these, I've just listed eight. There's probably many others you can insert in there, but here are examples. Now, th the New Testament hadn't even been thought of yet. So how can you say that anti-Semitism began in the pages of a book which hadn't even been written yet. A second thought about responding to this particular portion of the objection is that the Tanakh itself includes many divine and prophetic rebukes of the Jewish people. And the Tanakh, by the way, was written before the New Testament. Look in the book of Exodus. We don't have to go very far. Exodus chapter 33 verse 5, we read these comments by <laughs> what the Lord had said to Moses. He says, say to the sons of Israel, you are an obstinate people. Should I go up in your midst for one moment, I would destroy you. That's a scary thought. In Deuteronomy, years later, maybe 40 years or so later, who knows how many years later, we read, for I know your rebellion and your stubbornness, talking to Israel. Moses is addressing them. This is uh, not long before he dies. He says, after my death, you will act, what? Corruptly and turn from the way which I have commanded you. He's speaking for what God has told him to say. So these, in a way, are the Lord's words, of course. Roughly 1,400 or so, they, as they're ready to begin taking the land, not uh, too long after this. Here's a quote a number of years later, that was more like 1400, we're talking 
800 years or so later, in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 3. And then he said to me, and this is uh, the vision he has, Son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. You know, and this is just, now we, we, there are literal, I mean, there's so many of examples of these kinds of rebukes that have uh, been expressed in the scripture. Um, it's fascinating when you think about it that the Jewish Bible would keep these in there. How many ancient nations would have <coughs> cut those parts out? Most ancient nations would never save things that uh, didn't do, make them look good. As these don't make Israel look very good. But these were criticisms by the Lord and by his prophets. In the Tanakh, as we in summary, in the Tanakh, God calls Israel unrighteous, we've seen, st obstinate, stubborn, rebellious, and corrupt, just to name a few things. Are these judgments anti-Semitic because they're critical of Israel? Is it fair to say that they are anti-Semitic? If so, then God himself is, is anti-Semitic, which is obviously not the case. The third area I want to address in responding to just part one here is do the verses, the text of the New Testament itself, in any way, do they sound anti-Semitic? I cite a few from the book of Romans. Chapter 11, verse 28, the second part of it, which reads, from the standpoint, and I've inserted a few helper words in this text so we can follow the trend of thought here that Paul is writing to the congregate, the believers in Rome. From the standpoint of spreading the gospel, they, Israel, currently at that time, are enemies, really meaning adversaries, for your sake. They're opposing the spread of that. For your sake, O Romans, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Catch that? Israel, despite their resistance to the gospel, God sees them as beloved for the sake of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Chapter 3, verse 1, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. Did you hear that? Great in every respect, Paul says. First of all, that they, meaning Israel, were entrusted with the oracles of God. God apparently considered and valued Israel quite highly, despite all of the rebukes that we had just looked at, and many more. In Romans 15, the second part of verse 27, we read this text, For if the Gentiles have shared in Israel's spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them. Did you hear that? Indebted. You owe us. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them, also in material things. Hmm. These verses, and again, the New Testament is filled with them. These verses are just simply representative of the entire New Testament. And they reveal that the New Testament is not anti-Semitic, but here's a new word for you, philo-Semitic, meaning not opposed to the Jewish people, but loving the Jewish people. 
So I form a conclusion for part one, if you'll allow me. A conclusion based on these results. Many nations were anti-Semitic long before the New Testament was written. We've seen that. The Jewish Bible itself, which was written way before the New Testament, contains many divine rebukes of Israel, but it can hardly be termed anti-Semitic. I think you would agree. Overall, then, the New Testament presents a positive view of the Jewish people, not a negative one. Therefore, as far as this portion of the objection is concerned, anti-Semitism did not begin on the pages of the New Testament, even if the New Testament was, at times, critical of the Jewish religious leaders. So was God in the Tanakh. That does not constitute anti-Semitism. This deserved a full Pinocchio. Number two. Remember, we have four parts to this. The New Testament presents a negative depiction of the Pharisees. Hmm. This might seem to be a little harder. It's actually a little easier. To be fair, I want to be fair. I'm trying to be fair. There are many negative comments in the New Testament about, about many of the Pharisees of that day. There really are. How about these? Let me show you just a couple to remind you. I'm sure you remember most of these. Matthew chapter 5 is Yeshua speaking, the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. I mean the Sermon on the Mount. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, uh-oh, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Gee, unless you're better than the Pharisees, that didn't make the Pharisees probably feel really good, who were in the audience when this was shared. In Matthew 23, verse 27, again Yeshua is speaking. One of the many woes that he spoke to, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Not exactly a term of endearment. For you are like whitewashed tombs. Uh, this, this, you know, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Matthew 23. Now, I think that's a pretty harsh accusation. I don't know that any of us here have ever said anything like that to anybody we expect to talk to again. I, that would be a, uh, a friendship breaker. <laughs> Do you know at one point, I didn't put it up here, but one, I, I just want to mention, at one point, the disciples came over to Yeshua after some of these comments, and they said, Shh, by the way, I think you might have offended the Pharisees. And, I, and I, I couldn't help but think of what's going on in today's political world. Sometimes speaking truth to power is not well received. You may have noticed. Oh man, I'm so tempted to get into that, but I must, I'm <laughs> forcing myself not to. Uh, please forgive me for even that. But the point was Yeshua spoke truth. He spoke truth. And it, and it was not an easy message because nobody likes to be corrected. Men especially. Ladies, you know that, right? <laughs> you, don't make, you don't make points with men but when you're telling them everything they did wrong. But how do you tell them anything then? I mean, how do you correct them? How do you let them know that, you know? It, that ought to be part of one of, of one of your meetings, Audrey. You ought to touch on how to, how to be a, a gentle corrector. 
or how do you how do you how do you help your husband or your boyfriend or something understand that what they are the direction they're headed in is not ideal <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find nice the nicest words I can to, to, to couch that these don't seem like those woe to you hypocrites whitewashed tombstone oh god <laughs> however however these kinds of conflicts were really internal family religious quarrels. They were between Yeshua, who is Jewish, and the religious leaders, who were also Jewish. But especially between Yeshua and those who control the temple in Jerusalem. Now, a lot of this happened down in, in the Jerusalem area which included the Sadducees who were in charge of the temple and what I'll call the local Pharisees, the ones who were living down in Jerusalem because the Pharisees lived throughout the land, north and south, and some lived in Jerusalem area. So he had groups of Pharisees around him a lot, Yeshua did. In fact, at the beginning of his ministry, when the leadership in Jerusalem heard about what was going on, what Yeshua was beginning to do up in the Galil, they sent representatives up there to check it out. When the Pharisees, it says, you read about when the Pharisees from Jerusalem came up to hear Yeshua in the north. They came to hear him. They wanted to hear firsthand. But this was arguments or disagreements, however you want to say, squabbles, quarrels between Jewish community members. Now I also want to point out not all of the Pharisees that are presented in the New Testament are presented in a negative light. Those quotes I just uh, showed you certainly were not very positive. I think you'd probably agree. But not all the Pharisees were presented negatively. For example, you probably heard of this guy, Nicodemus. He was a high-level Pharisee called a ruler of the Jews. And he was presented in a positive light. In fact, the traditions say that not only at the end, of course, when he came to, to help Joseph of Arimathea bury the body of Yeshua, that in the years that followed, tradition has it that he came to faith and spoke strongly in favor of Yeshua. Maybe you'll go see him in heaven. When the Sanhedrin arrested Peter and the apostles in Acts 5, and it says they intended to kill them. They intended to kill the Peter and the, and the apostles. They were right around the temple. A Pharisee named Gamaliel stood up and cautioned them not to do this lest they, what, be found fighting against God. That was a great comment he made. Wow. Was he a believer too? Well, I don't think so. And although the council decided, despite Gamaliel's in encouragement not to, to be careful of what they do here, the council had Peter and the apostles flogged but thanks to a Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel, they did not kill them, which is what they would have done. A third example, there was an, a, another Pharisee by the name of Paul, Shaul, Rav Shaul, who never denied that he was a Pharisee. In fact, he mentioned it uh, a number of times in the Berkhad Shah. Although he freely admitted, Shaul did, that whatever things were gained to me that he had learned and gotten and benefited from in his training, and Gamaliel was one of his instructors, whatever things were gained, and they were gained from his standpoint. These are not negative things. These are positive things he learned from the Jewish uh, leaders. Those things, he says, I counted as loss. He used a different word in the next sentence or two. <clears throat> Won't get into that. Those things were lost. I counted them lost to me for the sake of 
and I'll put in here, knowing and serving Messiah. He counted those things, which were gain at the time, of negative. They don't compare to what knowing Yeshua was all about. There are three examples of Pharisees that the, uh, the Brit Hadashah does not cast in a negative light. There were probably many more, though, that uh, did not seem to fare well with Yeshua. We do find an example, it's not in here in this list, of a, a number of Pharisees who had apparently come to faith. But these are three we know specifically by name. So my conclusion regarding this negative depiction of the Pharisees is this. Quarrels between Yeshua and the Pharisees cannot be rightly termed anti-Semitic because they were between Jews. I don't think either side was anti-Semitic. They had other differences, but they didn't hate them because they were Jews. They were all Jews. This objection is absolutely unsound. It deserves a full Pinocchio. <laughs> the New Testament alleges that the Jewish community is guilty of deicide. This is part three of the objection. Deicide, killing God. The Jewish community is guilty of that. And the, almost, the entire, te the entire um, origin of this particular accusation really is based on one verse from the Brit Kaddishah, from Matthew. Matthew 27, verse 25, which is after the Jewish crowd had convinced Pilate to have Yeshua crucified against his will. Remember, he washed his hands at the whole thing. He took the water in front of them. See, I washed my hands of this. It's not on my hands if that really, you know. You, you can't wash your hands of that. Sorry, Pilate. But he did it anyway, and he said, okay, we'll have him crucified in that case, and we'll free Barabbas. But in Matthew 27, verse 25, here's the text that upsets the Jewish community. And all the people said... His blood shall be on us, and here's where it gets even worse, and on our children. I want to read now a comment by a, a Jewish rabbinical scholar on this verse. And I doubt, if, if you haven't seen this before, it might be very revealing to you. It's by a gentleman named C.G. Montefiore, who uh, just died in 1938, only about 80 years ago. The rabbinic scholar, Montefiore, saw that, saw that verse as a terrible verse, whereby all the atrocities are, quote, wrought upon the Jews, are accepted and invoked upon their own heads by the Jews themselves. This is one of those phrases, he claims, which have been responsible for oceans of human blood and a ceaseless stream of misery and degradation, undoubtedly, in the Jewish community. This verse. And this verse has been used, unfortunately, to try to encourage people to be against Jewish people because look what they did. They cursed themselves. They invited it. They wanted Yeshua put to death, and they said, His blood be on us and our children. But I ask, what exactly did the crowd mean by those words? Because at first hand, it looks like that's a self-condemnation. We gladly take responsibility, guilt, for his death. That's what it looks like. Let me share with you a, a comment by a wonderful uh, Christian commentator on the Gospel of Matthew. His name is Leon Morris. 
you're looking for a good commentary, I highly recommend his on Matthew. He wrote, Matthew cannot possibly have meant that punishment for this mob's outrageous behavior would fall on every Jew in every place at every time. That would have included Matthew himself if Matthew had written that. Do you think that the mob could be responsible for a curse that extends to every Jewish person thereafter, wherever they are, forever? How about Michael Ray Delnick's comment, a, gentle, a gentleman that I think probably a lot of you know, and certainly have heard of him. Um, he's a Jewish believer, lives in, uh, right now in Chicago. <sighs> Michael wrote in his paper, uh, uh, published in 1987 in the uh, a journal called the Mishkan. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It's an international German, uh, international journal uh, in which people discuss issues about the gospel and, and Messianic Judaism and so on and, uh, out of a group in uh, Jerusalem. The Mishkan is published there. And he wrote a paper in 87 called His Blood Be Upon Us, which is uh, addressing this very issue. And here's what Michael Radelnik said. Only on the surface does this verse present a problem. When properly understood as a local acceptance of guilt, it is impossible to prove a deicide charge against the Jews from this text. You see, the crowd had no authority whatsoever to speak for others. Anyone who thinks that that verse in Matthew now condemns all Jews for all time is simply wrong. My conclusion for this part, it is absurd to claim that that verse in Matthew 27, 25 called down a condemnation on all Jews for all time simply because of the reckless and thoughtful words of one angry Jewish mob who was probably put up to it by Caiaphas and his ilk. People say things. You know, there's this, you've heard this phrase, mob think, right? This is the kind of thing that happens when you get into a mob a group of people that start to shout one thing, you get carried along with them. Pretty soon, you're part of it. Whether you agree with all that's being said or not, or what the mob says or stands for, you're part of it. I think this part of the objection deserves a full Pinocchio. Therefore, today's Jewish community is in no way guilty of deicide. Now we come to the fourth part. Anti-Semitism is an ongoing Christian plague. That hurts. If you're a Messianic Jewish believer, you're part of that accusation anyway. Because whether you think of yourself this way or not, you are part of this Christian community. You really are. You may not go along with all that they believe. I'm sure you don't. But on the other hand, a lot of the basics I hope you do agree with. Many of, let me mention this, regarding this particular point. Many of today's biggest supporters of Israel and Jewish people come from New Testament reading and studying Christians. Perhaps you know some. You may have... Some of your best friends are Christians. That's not a bad thing. Hopefully these are people who read and study this, the text of the scripture themselves as well as attend good teaching and listen with wisely and seek the spirit to, uh, to be a, a Berean, search the scriptures to see if these things are so. 
But many of the, uh, the biggest supporters come from those kind of folk. However, however, now it's where we have to get real. We still do. I mean, not that that was not real. This is. They're both. However, no one can deny that over time, at least part of the church, and I'll put that in capitals, the church, part of the church went from all Jewish. It started that way. It was all Jewish. That's a shock to most Jewish people who don't know anything about our faith. It started all Jewish. But then it became, well, mostly Jewish. It wasn't very long before it became mostly non-Jewish. And then partly anti-Jewish. Now, I didn't say mostly. I said partly anti-Jewish. After that, partly anti-Semitic, truth be told. In fact, rather than take the time this morning to how that happened and examples of that, I refer you to a message that I did about three months ago, which is all on the web again. Again, thanks to what the work of Chris, who I am very much indebted to and appreciate all the work this man has done to recreate our website and make it available. It's... Uh, it's wonderful, and I, I'm very in your debt, sir. See my sermon, I suggest, on Romans 11.11, 11, which was titled, Has the Church Provoked Israel to Jealousy? This was only given about three months ago here at Ben Navi. The date is on May 27, 2017. It's on the web. It explains how the sequence came about. We may wonder, though, as we consider this accusation, how even part of the church could have become so misled. How could that happen? The only explanation that I have can come up with is that over the years, Hasatan, the father of lies, has been unfortunately quite successful at blinding the eyes, not of all of the church, but part of it. He's pretty good at this. Be careful lest you think he's not. Because he'll get you. Unfortunately, I have to admit, there's a long list of early church fathers whom I'm not going to take time to go into, but again, it's on that sermon, who became vehemently anti-Semitic over the years. Why? Because they were unsuccessful at evangelizing Jewish people. Martin Luther is one of the examples. A man who started out very pro-Israel, but who got exasperated as time went by with the lack of the positive Jewish response to his message, and over time became so frustrated by it that he turned into a, a vehement anti-Semite. Yet, Martin Luther is elevated within the church as the great reformer, which in probably some very important ways he really was. A fascinating individual to study, but this, in his later years, not so fascinating. But there are many others who develop this anti-Semitic position. And why were these people so unsuccessful? Aren't you curious? Okay then come to Monday's Kavara group, <laughs> which is going to be in Mission Viejo, and let's talk about it. Information on that is in the bulletin. Bonnie and I will be there on Monday night at the home of Jack and Jana, and hopefully you'll join us Monday night at that Kavara group. My conclusion on this section 
part four of the objection to our faith. We must admit that anti-Semitism has been and continues to be, I'll call it somewhat, of a Christian plague. Hence, to be fair, I have to give this half a Pinocchio for this part of the objection. The challenge, folks, and for us to correct the misrepresenta misrepresentations of the New Testament that have crept into today's Christian community. And I am sorry to report, it's, it's been more successful than I would like to admit. But that is precisely why Ben David exists today. Are you ready? It's to restore the Jewishness of the gospel. May God enable us to do that. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we look to you because, uh, Lord God, once again, we realize our ina inadequacies. You are the only one who makes us adequate. Without you, we're, we're not able to do, accomplish anything of worth. So, Father, I just pray for your wisdom as we move forward as a congregation that we would hear from you and know how to respond in ways that are constructive and uh, help, help communicate uh, what the meaning is in the Brichat Shah to others who have distorted it and misinterpreted it and now misapply it. Lord God, we know that, uh, that Israel is still in your heart and you will never turn your back on that. You have promised that. So Lord God, uh, help us to, uh, to be an effective witness for you to our Jewish brothers and sisters and also to our Christian brothers and sisters who may have been incorrectly taught about Israel. And Lord, uh, we thank you for whatever success we achieve because if, if we achieve anything, it's because of you. May your spirit give us wisdom, Lord, and we thank you for him. In Yeshua's name, amen.